Well, alas, I need to finish up with Greek art today, which means that this lecture is going to be longer than either of us would like. One of those fasten your seatbelt days. At least next class, I get to listen to you. We'll return to the Parthenon now and focus all too briefly on its famous sculptures. I included this computer-generated color reconstruction, which is based on microscopic remnants of paint, but it's still kind of a scientific best guess. I included it to remind you that the Parthenon was not the pristine white monument that American architects copied so diligently in Washington, D.C. It was brightly, even garishly painted. So let's see more color reconstructions and get a quick overview of the Parthenon sculptures by turning to our Parthenon video very briefly once more. This is not a required work, but in your reading for today, you learned about how Greeks love their makis, that is, artistic depictions of Greeks fighting centaurs, centauromachi, giants, gigantomachi, Amazons, etc. All of these scary opponents are stand-ins for outsiders that the Greeks have vanquished. On the Parthenon, of course, this means the Persians. This isn't one of our required works, but I'm going to tell you the story anyway. Lapiths were humans from northern Greece, while centaurs were part man and part horse. The Lapiths invited the centaurs to the marriage feast of their king. At the feast, the host gave the centaurs wine, which inflamed the savage side of their nature. So they attempted to rape the women and kidnap the bride. Moral, don't give booze to centaurs. Political message, the Greeks turned back the savage Persian horde. A little Pericles self-promotion here. Remember, he's in the fundraising business. The Acropolis makeover did not come cheap. You watched a Khan Academy podcast about this work. Only fragments remain and have lived in the British Museum for almost 200 years. These are the famous Elgin marbles. But these reconstructions and key give you an idea of the entire work, which depicted the birth of Athena. According to Greek mythology, Zeus gave birth to Athena after a terrible headache prompted him to summon help from Hephaestus, the god of fire and the forge. To ease the pain, he ordered Hephaestus to strike him with his forging hammer, and when he did, Zeus's head split open and out popped the goddess Athena in full armor. The birth of Athena took place at dawn. Notice how the heads of the horses of Helios, the sun, are about to rise above the horizon, pulling behind them the life-giving sun. The horses' faces, you'll see, are full of energy, in contrast to the group of horses at the other end that appear fatigued. They're laboring with bulging eyes, open mouths, and tense muscles to end their journey below the horizon. These are the horses of Selene, the moon, and they're tired, for they're at the end of their journey across the night sky. So why is the sculpture composed this way? What problem does the artist need to solve? Well, the Greeks loved to decorate their pediments, but those triangles posed a compositional challenge. Just to see how much they've learned, here are pediment sculptures from two archaic temples. Note that the figures are not proportionate to each other, although by the time of the bottom work, artists had figured out that making figures recline helped solve the problem of fitting a narrative into a triangular space. So here we get a closer look at some of the Parthenon sculptures. The bottom set is one of the college board's required images. Note especially the spectacularly rendered drapery and the very clever use of the triangular space to add motion and variety to the sculpture. These figures are really interacting. The clinging clothing, which reveals more than it conceals, is, believe it or not, known as the wet drapery effect. So now you know where we get wet t-shirt contests. Note, too, that the figures are actually, as I just said, interacting with each other in a way that is compositionally complex. Uh, the high relief casts shadows and increases the impression of movement and volume as well. The West pediment sculptures, and this is not a required work, uh, they're shown here as a reconstruction, tell one of Athens' most famous founding legends, which is why I've included it. According to this legend, the first king of Athens, Cyclops, who, by the way, was half human and half snake, was looking for a patron for a city. Two of the Olympian gods wanted the job, Poseidon, the god of the sea, and Athena, the god of the wisdom. So King Cyclops asked each of the contestants to offer the city a gift, and he would choose as a patron the gods who made the best gift. Poseidon went first. He struck his powerful trident into the earth, and immediately water flew into the area and created a little pond. Unfortunately, the water in the pond tended to be salty. He is the god of the sea, so it was not very useful. 
Next, Athena stepped forward and planted an olive branch on the ground, and in moments a tall olive tree stood before the king. He preferred her gift because an olive tree is so useful. Its trunk can be used as firewood to build a house. It produces oil the people can use to cook their food, and its tree can cast a shadow. So Athena was chosen to be the representative of the city of Athens, and the olive branch went on to be a symbol for both prosperity and peace. I note again the vivid portrayal of movement, the way overlapping and, sh overlapping and shadow give a perception of depth. Also notice how the distinction between gods and humans is blurred. I mean, this is basically a story where the humans get to decide, you know, which god they want. Even in Greek religion, man was the measure of all things. So we've already talked about this work, the plaque of the Agust uh, Augustines, the Panathenaic Festival procession. Before we leave the Parthenon, let's watch one more clip about the Parthenon, its sad fate, and its renovation today. Not all of the architectural sculpture touched on larger-than-life mythology. Here we see a tender depiction of a young woman being waited on by her maidservant. The somber faces reflect the classical era, but also presumably the sad subject. This, after all, is a gravestone. Note that the stele is shaped like a small temple crowned by a pediment. The seated woman is in a high-backed chair, wearing the clothing of the Athenian upper class, while the servant girl is dressed in a long sleeve dress and headdress worn by barbarians. So this relief sculpture captures two Athenian social realities, the existence of slavery and the relegation of women to a domestic sphere. This is very much a domestic scene. One theory about this work is that the jewelry the woman was probably holding before the paint chipped off represented the woman's dowry, which would have been a significant economic contribution to her husband's household. So this would be a way that the sculpture connected the woman to her husband and to her father, the men in her life. Uh, the father would provide the dowry. And so, therefore, it would be covertly connected to the male dominance of which she was a part. So, symbolically, she's portrayed as a passive and secluded Athenian woman, fulfilling the male idea of women's social status in Athens. I talked about this exquisite small temple before. I noted that the Athenians erected a parapet wall to make it a less quelling place to visit. This is a quintessentially high classical sculpture. So what makes me say that? Well, the body is lovingly portrayed under the drapery, really more clinging and erotic than the bodies on the Parthenon pediment sculpture. I'm not sure that there is a more exquisite sculpture of clothing in all of art history. The dynamism of the sculpture, the somewhat diagonal lines, the expressiveness of the body, even the enhanced eroticism, all point in the direction we're moving, which is toward Hellenistic Greece. But first, let's catch up with a little history. The parapet wall's repeated images of Nike's victory had a certain sad irony when this sculpture was made. In 410, when the wall was erected, Athens had already suffered a devastating plague and a number of humiliating defeats in the war it was fighting with Sparta and its allies, the Peloponnesian Wars. Just six years later, Athens would surrender to Sparta. Do you remember when I gave you the intriguing question the College Board probably won't ever ask? When does art destroy culture? A pretty strong argument could be made that Pericles' demand for treasure from Athens' allies in the Delian League to build his Acropolis masterpieces, along with the Greek city-state's rebellion against Athenian greed and hegemony, or control, helped bring down classical Greece. Fortunately for art history, a new Greek culture would soon emerge. You know, I may have given this video a link twice, but if we haven't already seen it, uh, let's finish the Parthenon video with a little of this troubled history. So the classical period climaxed and then ended with King Philip of Macedon's conquest of Greece. While the Greeks considered Philip a barbarian, Philip, who had spent much of his youth in Thebes, was actually a huge admirer of Greek culture and helped spread it to the world. So, for example, he invited Aristotle to his capital to serve as a tutor to his young son, the fellow we would go on to call Alexander the Great. This is where we skip a whole lot of really interesting history, and I'm sorry. We're going to watch a couple of short video clips from a video about the Macedonians, Alexander the Great, and the Hellenistic world. If you'd like to know more about this and are sorry we we're skipping over it so quickly, think about watching the rest of the video. It's up on Moodle. 
The mosaic here depicts Alexander's victory over Darius III, which is really the climatic moment of his invasion and conquest of the Persian Empire. In some ways, we're getting ahead of our story, since this mosaic dates from the early Roman Empire. It was found on the floor of a villa in Pompeii. But as you learned in the podcast, this mosaic was almost certainly a copy of an early 3rd century BC Hellenistic painting, possibly by Philoxenus of Eritrea. I don't think you need to memorize that scary name, but you do need to know that it's thought to be a copy of a, of a Greek painting. Alexander's breastplate depicts Medusa, the famous Gorgon who turned all who saw her to stone. And his wavy hair is typical of royal portraits uh, in Greek art in the 4th century BC. He's portrayed sweeping into battle at the left uh, on his favorite, famous horse, Bucephalus. And notice how he is focusing his gaze on the Persian leader, Alexander, is right in the middle of the battle, which we know historically he really was. Darius is shown in a chariot. He seems to be desperately commanding his frightened charioteer to flee the battle while stretching out his hand. Is he making a gesture to Alexander? Is he possibly throwing a javelin? Alas, we don't know. He has a very worried expression on his face. The charioteer is whipping the horses as he tries to escape. If this mosaic is any guide, Greek painting must have been amazing. So what stylistic elements, stylistic innovations really, do we see in this work? Presumably the mosaic artist was imitating the painter. Well, we see radical foreshortening. Look at that central horse, his butt, basically. We see the use of shading to convey a sense of mass and volume and to enhance the naturalistic effect of the scene. We see repeated diagonal spears. Remember diagonal lines and their association with action? We see clashing metal, crowding of men and horses. All of this evokes the din of battle. And yet at the same time, the action kind of stands still with a few dramatic details. So we see the fallen horse and the Persian soldier in the foreground who is actually watching his own death throes reflected in a shield. So here's a quick look at Alexander's conquests and a map of the Greek world after its divide among its generals. Okay, so let's begin with a final video clip that shows the world created when Alexander's kingdom was split into several kingdoms among, among his generals. As you just saw in the video, these new cities were Greek, but they were a new kind of Greek. The one-time citizen of the polis, Greek city-states were actually very parochial and self-contained. So the one-time citizen of the polis is now a cosmopolitan. Politan means citizen, and what does the word cosmos mean? It means world. So a citizen of the world. We have a different perspective. So let me offer up a couple more words that should enter your art history vocabulary. Syncretism means bringing together or merging elements from many cultures. Greek and then Roman religion and culture become increasingly syncretistic. Basically, they're willing to absorb concepts from the East. Uh, in the next unit, we'll see that Buddhism actually picks up artistic influences from the Greeks. Oikumene. Oikos means household. In Greek terms, the essential family and economic unit. Intriguingly, this is the root not only of the word ecumenical, which we use to describe cooperative efforts by diverse churches, but also the terms economy and ecology, dealing with social and environmental interaction. Basically, the scope not only of interaction, but also of sympathy expanded during this period. Pathos is feeling, empathy is feeling for or understanding others. Hellenistic art explored both. It was emotional, and unlike Greek art that always celebrated Greeks smiting the others, we begin to see where well, they're still smiting the other, but they're showing more sympathy for the fallen enemy. I keep including non-required works that I like. This beautiful small bronze, again, isn't required, but I included it because it shows how Hellenistic culture is fascinated with and empathetic toward other cultures. So this is thought to portray a dancer in Alexandria, Egypt, which is one of those cosmopolitan cities where Greek culture met and married Near Eastern culture. And Egypt, in particular, uh, melded its traditional culture with the Greeks. Although the subject appears to be exotic and foreign, the statue exhibits a lot of Greek characteristics. So what are some of these? 
while we see that twisted figure with that chiastic counterbalance that is very typical of the Hellenistic work, the, the diagonal, the drapery folds that simultaneously reveal and conceal her form, the sense of movement, her expressive face, all of this identified as a work that is Greek rather than Egyptian in style, but the subject still captures the new wider Greece. So, oops, I forgot to turn this one to black, uh, the print. Now we move to a work that is required. You saw the city of Pergamon on the video and you read about its history in your last assignment. Pergamon was a major Hellenistic capital in what today is Western Turkey. This altar was a tribute to King Attalos I's victory against the Gauls. Like many Hellenistic works, it's huge and designed to reflect the king's great wealth as well as his military victory. This was located near the royal palace on the city's Acropolis. This is not an actual altar, by the way, but a reconstruction in a museum in Berlin. It's a huge reconstruction. Basically, there's an entire museum devoted to it. I haven't been there, but it is on my list. Well, this model should give you some sense of where the altar fit into the Acropolis. The second photo shows the famous friezes at the bottom of the imposing staircase of the altar and how they kind of spill over onto the stairway. So Attalos I wanted to identify his city with Athens, hence Athena's prominent place in the frieze. As you read, he paid to erect monuments in Athens, but he also used the altar friezes to signal that Pergamon was a new Athens. So why does a frieze depicting Athena fighting the titans or giants send this signal? Well, and I mentioned this before, throughout the classical period, giants or centaurs or Amazons were stand-ins for the barbarians that threatened Greece. Frankly, the Gauls that Attalos defeated were posed nowhere near the same threat as Persia had. But Attalos enjoyed drawing the comparison nevertheless. Like Pericles, he was a self-promoter. But if the themes are similar, the form of Hellenistic sculpture is very different from that of classical Greece. Compare this Athena with the more sober Athena of the Parthenon. Uh, this is an artist running. Oops, let's see if it comes up. Oh, there it comes. Sorry about that. So what do you see? This Athena is an action figure, all movement and dynamism. Vertical lines have given way to diagonal lines. There's much more drama, tension, and emotion in this Hellenistic sculpture. So here's another comparison between the Pergamon frieze and Apollo and Artemis from the Parthenon frieze. The high classical style, you'll see it's calm, even severe. It's vertical and horizontal, it's quite stable. The Hellenistic Athena is diagonal and dynamic. Okay, this isn't a required work, but it's another Gigantomachy from the Pergamon altar, and I wanted you to see this as well. So what Hellenistic elements do you observe? We see those twisted bodies, the violent movement, the expressions of agony, the drapery that seems to be blowing in the wind, lots of movement, lots of drama. By the way, when we get to Baroque art again, we'll see that it was very heavily influenced by Hellenistic sculpture. At any rate, these are not gods standing serenely above the fray. They are fighting tooth and nail. Okay, I'm a little amazed that one of these sculptures didn't make the cut. They are very famous. These are bronze marble copies of Greek bronzes that were probably on the altar of Pergamon. The subjects of both are Gauls, the defeated enemy. But what strikes me, and also strikes a Hellenistic note, is not only the expressive power of these statues, the agony, the twisting, but even more that the sculptor is so willing to acknowledge the humanity and suffering of foreigners. This is a cosmopolitan worldview. So it's interesting to compare this dying Gaul with an archaic dying warrior found on the pediment of an archaic temple. I'd note for one thing that this is an especially creepy example of the archaic smile. But what other differences do you see between these two figures? And I, by the way, I could imagine you being asked this by the college board, even though these aren't required works. So the Greek on the bottom is serene, seemingly content to die for his polis. His body is muscular and beautiful. It is not writhing in a death agony. The dying Gaul, just 250 years later, is dying in expressive agony. So which figure draws your sympathy? Is it the Greek warrior on the bottom? Is it possible that he is meant not to draw so much your sympathy as your admiration? So here's another wonderful required work and another quintessential example of Hellenistic sculpture. Nike, uh, actually originally Nike was, was a Bronze Age goddess, but she gets merged, as I mentioned before, with Athena in her role as the goddess of victory. And here she's landing on a stone 
carved to look like a Greek warship that was celebrating a naval victory. So when she still had an arm, it was holding out a wreath to crown the naval victor. Notice how the clothing reveals more than it disguises the body. If anything, it adds to the erotic impact of the piece. I mean, for instance, you see her navel uh, that's clinging that closely to her. Uh, it goes beyond the counterbalancing symmetry of classical sculpture to, a to asymmetry, movement, even the possibility that at any moment she'll take flight. Note again that the Hellenistic artists love diagonal lines, which we know gives a sense of movement to works. This statue would have reflected light from the water, which would have further enhanced the sense of lightness and movement. This is art as high emotional drama. This is art as opera, if you will. But note, it is also art in service of the state and its glory. Hellenistic art may be more individualistic, it may be more emotional, but the honor of the Greek kingdoms is still being celebrated in art. This is still about power and authority. So let's compare our two Nikes. What similarities and differences do you see? Both celebrate Greek victories, both portray beautiful drapery, or portray drapery beautifully, I should say, and more than hint at the body beneath. The dialogue between revealing and concealing is not new to Hellenistic art. Both convey movement, but the Nike of Samothrace is more active, more vibrant, more theatrical. I think of Peter Pan swinging in on those wires. Well, here is still another work that failed to make the College Board cut, but since it is one of the most famous pieces of erotic or at least provocative art in world history, I am sticking it in anyway. This is the Venus de Milo. Once again, I'm including multiple images, even though it makes the slide rather busy, since you can only see the full power of this sculpture by viewing it from multiple directions, which is another characteristic of Greek sculpture. Note that this is larger than life and that the dress is slipping down. Will it slip off? That's a tease that renders the statue more provocative. So with this bronze, which is a required work, we return to the popular Greek theme of the magnificent athlete. But how is this athlete different from earlier athletes we've seen? And actually, I now realize that we haven't done the Discobolus, which is the same era as the spear thrower. But think of the spear thrower, even though he's a warrior. So this fellow is battered and bruised. His nose and teeth are broken. Inlaid copper blood drips from cuts on his forehead, nose, and cheeks. Okay, terrible confession time. You are going to need to know about lost wax bronze casting, which is the method used here. But we're running out of time, and this particular form of additive sculpture is about to disappear for about a thousand years. When it reappears in late medieval Europe, we'll catch up and learn about this technique. I promise. So let's compare this with an earlier bronze from the high classical period. They're superficially uh, similar. We have basically two very buff guys, obviously strong and powerful. But I think the emotional message and impact are entirely different. The Riace bronzes, and they're named because they were found in a shipwreck off Riace, have also fallen off the College Board list, but I can imagine you being asked to identify the period of each of these sculptures. The Riace warrior is clearly classical, the seated boxer is clearly Hellenistic. Uh, here's still another work that used to show up a lot on AP exams. It's missing from the list, but I could imagine you're being asked what era this comes from, and clearly it's Hellenistic. Gone are youth and beauty. They're replaced by emotional realism, and again, empathy. Note that this sculpture, too, uses contrapposto, but it's less perfectly balanced than classical sculpture. Hellenistic sculptors are willing to put their figures a little off balance to create that sense of movement as befits an old lady less steady than her feet as well. This too employs drapery both to reveal and conceal, yet while the subject is beautifully rendered, she is hardly heroic or beautiful. We feel her aches, her pains, and her struggle. With this sculpture, we come to the era of Roman Greece. This work from the first century CE, we haven't seen those initials for a while, was unearthed in Rome in 1506 with Michelangelo looking on, apparently ooing and eyeing, and certainly he was highly influenced by this work. The sculpture was found in the remains of the palace of the Roman Emperor Titus. Stay tuned. The original, according to the Roman histor historian Pliny, was attributed to Athenodorus, Hagasandrorus, and Polydorus of Rhodes. I would recommend just remembering the Rhodes part. Lacoan was a Trojan priest who saw through the horse offered by the Greeks and the gods who sided with the Greeks, sent sea serpents to strangle him and his two sons. 
The Trojans interpreted this as the gods punishing Lacoan for lying. They welcomed the horse into the city, and I hope you know the rest of the story. So this is Hellenistic art at its apogee. Note the expressive emotion, the twisted figures, the diagonal lines, the elaborate asymmetrical composition with counterposing balance, the dramatic view from every side. I frankly can't believe that this work didn't make the cut. It's perhaps the favorite from past classes. At any rate, I also can't believe I'm covering it in 30 seconds. My profound apologies. Ooh, we have covered a lot of material and really haven't given our required works all the time they deserve, so I certainly hope you did your reading. I hate to leave Greece behind, but the clock is ticking, so on to Rome.